everybody. Hey, Barry, thanks for coming on today and being my guest. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, like always, I'm excited about our topic. I'm excited about every topic. But um, so we're talking about if you want to be a landlord in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, we'll, we'll get a little bit into the nitty gritty about the fact that we're going to focus mainly on D.C. in this episode. But, um, you know, f- for people who have uh, listened to this before, they know that my first career was not in real estate. Um, and I know you from a past iteration of my life. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other for about, I don't know, 15 it's years probably or so. 15, probably. 16 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I went into real estate about, oh God, seven years ago or so, um, you had gone into property management. When, when did you go in? Uh, it'll be 16 years about now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So you started, yeah. you probably went right into that right after we met, I guess. Yeah. So I was at the gym with you, I guess, for about six months and then I left and then went into doing half property management and half sales. And then um, went in with somebody who was already had an established business and that's how I got into it and um, then took on that. And then eventually he went on to something else. I took over the whole business and then grew that business and then started my own business a few years later. So, Well, so for everybody who's listening, I mean, um, you know, Barry's been an amazing resource for me for the last however many years because this kind of thing, property management, rental properties comes up in DC a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot, because it's a strong real estate market. You know, almost anyone in real estate will tell you that it's a fairly insulated market, even when the market, you know, is down in yeah. general around the country, it's going to do fairly well within the beltway. Um, knock on wood, of course. Um, <laughs> and so it comes up and the thing is, you know, People will ask me if I can help them find an investment property. There are people who buy their first home knowing it's not their forever home. And then they decide, oh, maybe I should rent this out. Maybe I don't have to sell it and get the proceeds to buy my next place. Maybe this could be an investment for me. Right. So it comes up all the time. Yeah. And, um, and anyway, so I thought it would be a good episode for you and I, Barry, to break down for people kind of expectations, how the process works, because you know, you see a 30 second snippet on TikTok or Instagram and it's mm-hmm. like, I got a property and now I'm making money. Right. And it'd be great if it was just that simple, <laughs> right? <laughs> Doesn't work like that here. And I mean, to be fair, this, the, the kind of the example I gave of owning a property or that's not your forever home and then renting it out, that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to live in a 520 square foot one bedroom for the rest of my life. And I was lucky that I didn't have to sell it when, you know, when I moved into my next place. So I had to go down this road. And actually, I think you, you were probably one of the main resources that yeah. I went. So, I anyway. so. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so let's get things started. So, you know, I, I do think that there's like two different avenues, really, that people go down. There are the strict investors. Hey, I have some money. I want to put it in real estate. Right. I think you deal a lot with those. And yep. then I think I deal a lot with the with the other end of the spectrum, which is the people who like think about becoming landlords and then like inadvertently kind of become one. Right. Um, and to be honest, the process is the same for either of those people who end up becoming landlords, basically. The process say. is the same. The mindset is different. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the, yeah. the ones that get referred to me by agents are usually the people who buy the properties, they live there for a year or so, and then they get transferred or they move or they want to get out or they're just done with DC or they just whatever their job got relocated. So that mindset is different than an investor who comes in and is like, I just bought this property as an investor. I don't live here. Don't want to live here. I want to rent it out as passive income and eventually you know, see how that goes. So the mindset, and that's what I always have a conversation with people about initially is what is your mindset? You know, what do you want out of this? What are you doing with it? Are you going to move back in it at some point? Or or is this just an investment property to you? Because that changes the way I can take somebody on as a client. Because if they're in the mindset that it's just, I want to rent it out for a year or two and then move back, it's totally different than a true investor who puts money into it to see a return on it and to see this over a period of time. Um, you can just tell when you're speaking to them that initially what their mindset is. And, and, you know, they're like, usually the investors is like, go do what you got to do, make it work. And, you know, the, the homeowner who moves out, you know, usually has a different mindset that, you know, they put the work into it. They put, you know, 
aren't these cabinets amazing? Somebody has to love these cabinets or these love these, <laughs> you know, that's just, that's your style. It, it doesn't mean everybody's going to love it. And, you know, there's, there's a, a sense of uh, almost, you don't want to hurt their feelings by everybody coming in and saying, you know, their thoughts about everything. And then, well, I mean, like, yeah, you don't, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings regardless, like in life. Yeah. Right. But I mean, it's kind of like, it's similar to when I talk about when people are selling their homes and they, they assess a certain amount of value to their home because they did X, Y, and Z to it, which was to their liking. Right. You know, that's, I mean, it's sad like to say, but that kind of doesn't matter sometimes, you know, like if you put yeah. in this like specialty, whatever that, you know, cabinet facing that people don't even recognize, it just looks like a, a nice white cabinet, you know, then, yeah. you know, it's yeah i mean real estate to resell something you you have to do upgrades i think for you not to resell it and i think if it looks nice and it, it does well that's that's great as a bonus but especially in the investment world like we try to keep costs low and to make things look good and be functional without going overboard because the return especially on a rental is so minute compared to when you sell it that putting in you know toto toilets and small slabs of white granite or, or marble or whatever you're going to do in the kitchen just doesn't have the return rate. I mean, you get a clientele that may appreciate it, but you're not going to get, you know, dollars per whatever you put into it. So we just try to be careful of what they do and, and what they're doing to it, because that that's when the emotional tug happens with the owner is that, you know, I spent $45,000 upgrading this. I want $10,000. I'm like, eh, and it <laughs> it's better than some baths. It's like, yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Go. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's kind of sure. start from the beginning. So let's say like landlords and their rights in DC, Maryland and Virginia. Um, yep. So, you know, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but I'll just kind of say it out loud. So most of your business is in DC. It is. Um, and you have done some work in Virginia and Maryland. And I want to make sure yeah. people who are listening know that there we're going to paint with some wide brushstrokes here so that we're kind of explaining this to people. But you said yeah. something really good to me before we started about uh, the differences between DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And maybe you can just kind of say that for everybody here, because I think sure. it'll make a lot of sense. So all three jurisdictions or states uh, are divided into different laws. So the state of Virginia is what they claim a landlord's right state, which means that the landlord has the right to invoke different policies in the lease, meaning when a lease ends in Virginia, it ends. And it usually ends at midnight on the date that it ends. That's the way the lease is structured. And the landlord has the right to do rent increases differently than D.C. and Maryland. And it's just more of a landlord's based rules. So they have the right to create their own, you know, rules in the lease and those terms of the lease. There's no holdover like there is in DC. It has to be formally written into the lease about holdover and, th and things that are taken differently in DC and, and Maryland. So Maryland, on the other hand, is a tenants rights jurisdiction. And it's probably one of the strongest in the country. Uh, I think there's only a couple other jurisdictions or states that have, you know, just as strong, but, um, Tenants have free legal representation here. They can call DC housing in a flash. Um, DC promotes fines on properties. Um, it's very strict and it's very pro to the tenant because they want to make sure the tenant's protected. Uh, it's just what Washington is regarding investment real estate. So it's very uh, pro tenant, which is why I think management helps, especially for owners that are not familiar with the laws, rules, and regulations here. Um, just because you can write a lease and download a lease from online doesn't make it really in effect and with the D.C. government and the, and the laws that jurisdict here. Um, and also D.C. requires a business license. Uh, so there's a process for that. And, you know, I'm sure you've gone into that before or go into that with somebody else or me if you want. Um, and then Maryland <laughs> is split into a facet of different things. So Maryland is split into counties and then cities within those counties. So like Montgomery County is a county just north of Washington, D.C. Um, so they have their own rules and regulations. And then you have to also follow the rules and regulations of the state of Maryland and Arundel County, Baltimore County. But then things like Baltimore City or Anne Arundel County and then Annapolis, like and then Annapolis City. So each city within the county has its own set of landlord tenant guidelines. Um, and you really have to be work in those areas to really understand what the rules are, which is why I, I, when I started my business, I was like, this is all I'm going to do here. In the past, I've done all three, but you just can't keep up to, and, and rules just keep changing every year. They keep changing. So yeah. it's too much to keep up with. And I wanted to make, I wanted you to say that kind of out loud on air because, 
you know, my involvement in a lot of this is people will come to me and say, I want a place that I can rent out in the future. That's, that's a pretty common thing people say to me. Um, and, you know, the, so first we have to make sure that, you know, if it's a condo that is, you know, that they you can, can rent actually it. rent it out and that there's like an investor ratio and check all that kind of stuff out, which is usually <sighs> something that a normal Joe Schmo can't see in the MLS. And it's, you know, you kind of have to have somebody help you with it. Right. But beyond that, um, you know, it's not, it's not apples to apples. It's like, well, where are you talking about? Are you talking about DC? Are you talking about Maryland? You know, people want to get some money from a rental eventually, but there's time and money that will be spent into setting things up properly. Right. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've told people in very broad terms, like Virginia is probably the easiest place to be a landlord and DC and Maryland are more Stop tenant her. friendly. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean people can't do it or they shouldn't, or they should shy away from it, but it's just, you know, it's, it is pretty different across the board and you're totally right. Like Montgomery County has its own sets of papers that we have to do, you know, paperwork in addition to the fact that you're, it's, it's in obviously the state of Maryland. So, um, I think it's important. I think that a, ma a major kind of number one takeaway so far in this episode is that you should make sure that you're properly educated about what you need to get things set up. And right. I think that's the key. I think educate yourself before you buy something. I, I think if you're looking to make it an investment property after you leave, I think you have to do your homework to figure out, okay, where do you want to be? Where do you think the best value for your property is going to be? And how long do you want to keep it? Um, you know, and what do you think you're going to make on it? What is your mortgage? What is it your, you know, what can you potentially get for it as rent? Are you at least covering that? I can tell you probably 90% of my owners just cover their costs. Um, there's very few in DC just due to the prices of the properties and the rents not being as high as they used to. Um, they're basically just covering costs and the return is when they sell it. Um, and most of my clients are long-term clients. So I would say on average, they stay around five years, but the long-term clients I've I've had some of them for 15 years and they just use me as like a financial advisor would that this is their investment. They buy more properties with me over time and it just becomes a flow of income for them every month. And that's what they do. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, you, you kind of were starting to talk about like, what are the proper expectations of having an investment property in this area? You know, if you had right. to give some major kind of, you know, expectations, <clears throat> how do you set up your clients? Um, I think a lot of them get referred to me. So a lot of them are already set up. So I, I can't say everybody has, you know, a lot of people want the big names. Uh, they want to be in Washington or they want to be in, you know, what I call the the prime five, like Georgetown, DuPont, Logan, you know, those kind of big mm -hmm. neighborhoods that are heard all over the world. Um, but the deals, I think, and if I buy investment properties, they're not always in the big neighborhoods just because you can get more for your money and you can get decent rents in other neighborhoods. And that's a whole nother probably show, but for this <laughs> show, um, I, I think, you know, expectations, you know, if you're going to buy a million dollar plus property, you have to, I would consult with somebody. I work with a, a pretty large team, pretty ongoing in, in Georgetown that refers me a lot. And, you know, their clients are, are fairly knowledgeable people. Uh, but even with all mm -hmm. that knowledge, their expectation level has to be set. Um, and they usually meet with me right before they buy the property and we'll go through it and I'll set their expectations on rent and what they think is proper. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll chat about, you know, upgrades or where do you think, you know, you want to be, when do you want to get this rented? Um, there's timing involved in it. There's, you know, because of COVID and what's happened in the last two years, that's affected the DC rental market quite a bit, um, with more people leaving than they are coming here. And it, it's coming back a little bit. Um, but it definitely took a huge hit to the, to the rental business in DC. So I think expectations are probably the number one thing I, I tell my clients and I, I really try to talk with them. Um, and not every client is for me. And, you know, it's, like I tell them, like you're interviewing me, I'm interviewing them because sure. it, it has to be a fit and it's a relationship business. Um, unlike a sale where it's, there's a beginning, a middle and an end, this really doesn't end until it can be years. So you really have to have a good relationship with these people because you know, you're, you're taking care of usually their biggest investment or, or asset. Yeah. Well, and I think like if we're actually giving any bullet points of, of expectations, it sounds like a fair, you know, expectation might be you're not going to bank money on a month to month basis on a rental. Um, some people might, but I mean, I, I can, I can speak from personal experience. I bought my place in 2009 and in 2021, 
I'm really not banking that much every month because my condo fees have gone up and, you know, yeah. my mortgage has stayed the same. Um, and now it's an 11 year old property. So now I'm replacing things right. and we're not going to get into like write offs and, and right. taxes and all that kind of stuff. But the point is like, you know, more or less I have the person living in my place paying the mortgage. And so <clears throat> I'll realize that benefit when I sell it, um, or when it's paid off in full. Right. And I just, right have a place sitting there. Um, <clears throat> so I think that is kind of a common misunderstanding in the beginning of thinking that an investment property is going to be a positive cash flow or, or something so, significant. Yeah. So I usually tell people, and I get friends that ask me about this too, they're like positive cash flow that, you know, they, they see people online and, and it's all over online. Um, <laughs> you can't always have positive cash flow with one property. Um, most of the time you have to have something like a small multifamily building where kind of, let's say you have four units in the building. One of those units is taking the brunt of the finances and then the other three are usually the cash flow, um, to them. Uh, it's very hard on one property just because you're focusing so much energy and so much money. If something breaks or if something goes wrong on that one property. So if you take a hit for one month, well, there goes that profit for that month, whether you're renting it for $1,500 or $6,000 a month that, you know, the bigger the house, the bigger the problem sometimes. Um, so you just have to be careful of kind of what you're doing when you're getting into it. Um, I, I always think if you can buy multifamily, it's a better investment if you're looking to make money um, than just buying one piece of property if you can swing it. Yeah, if you can swing it, if you can find it. <laughs> that's the other problem. I mean, in, yeah, that's, in, a, that's the yeah, problem, I so. think, is even just finding. I mean, you know, so I I started talking about this, but, you know, there if you buy a condo in D.C., um, and sometimes even I think HOAs would probably have rules about this as well, yeah. probably to a lesser degree. But you might not even be able to rent your property out according to the rules. There are investment ratios. There are caps. There sometimes are wait lists. Those things yeah. can change. Those yeah. things are not necessarily set in stone. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a multifamily is obviously great because if it's one building and you control all of it, then yeah. great. You don't have to deal with that. Um, yeah. But they are not a dime a dozen. They're not falling off of trees. And there no. are people who are who have been looking for this kind of opportunity oh, yeah. for decades. And so, you know, it's it's a harder kind of market to get into that with. It um, is. Um, and I think the owners who get into that are also prime investors and they may come in with two or three people that, you know, can put some money into them and they split it. Um, right. And, th that's and they're probably way. not listening to this episode, to be honest, no, because, because they probably know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, I think for the everyday, you know, person, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a condo. There's nothing wrong with having a little row house. And, and I think it's a good investment, especially in Washington. I, I think it's always been a good investment. Um, but I don't think it's a cash cow unless you own it outright and you're just getting money every month. But most people don't do that. Even the people who own it outright sometimes refinance them and take mortgages on them because, you know, certain tax things you can do with that. Um, and some people pull money out of one property to buy another property. Um, but I, I think overall, D.C. has been a, a very stable market in 16 years that I've been doing it. And it's had some ups and downs, but overall, it, it's pretty stable compared to the rest of the country in terms of rental yeah. amounts. And I think it would it, it would always stay like that. I think it's going to, I mean, I have a couple of clients who bought homes in, say, like Logan and Shaw, you know, mm -hmm. before those areas totally blew up for like, you know, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, you know, your four or five level townhomes, which right. <clears throat> would sell for millions, now. you know, yeah, at least 1.5 if it's not in good oh, shape yeah. and more. Um, so, you know, like that clearly a good investment. And there are areas in the city that are expanding, you know, that's always yeah. going to happen that are, yeah. that are building up, you know, you've got grocery stores going to different places. And so they're becoming yeah. more, um, the ease of living in other neighborhoods is, is obviously. And the expectations of tenants, the younger generations now is much higher than it has ever been of what they want. Um, oh, they want right. less of the old Washingtonian look and more of the, you know, sleek condo with every little bell and whistle in it. Even if they don't use it, they want it. Yeah. No, and, they, and they want the little niche neighborhoods too, you know, where it used to be, I want to live in DuPont or Georgetown. Now they want to live in wherever, no ho, so ho, whatever. Hey, whatever, whatever name <laughs> whatever they're, they're calling it. it. Yeah. <laughs> whatever the kids are calling it these <laughs> Whatever those days. kids are calling it these days. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so I guess, you know, if you had any kind of general um, advice as far as what kind of return you get in DC versus the suburbs or, you know, yeah. older property or new condo, condo row home, like, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody were to come to you truly and say, hey, I might live in a place, but I want to buy an investment property. How do you guide them in that regard? I think the first step is what's your budget? 
what are sure. you looking to spend? Um, if you're looking to spend $250,000, I would go in the suburbs. And the further away you get from Washington, the more you're going to get for your money. Um, you may get less rent, but you'll get something that you can afford and probably cover your your mortgage for every month. Um, whether you make an, an excess of that, I, you know, I don't know. It depends what neighborhood you are and how far out you go. Um, you know, I know the difference if, if you go in Bethesda in Maryland compared to, you know, I don't know, higher Gaithersburg or Germantown, you know, the price difference is significant, sure. although it's creeping up in those areas, but you know, you're still getting quality rents. I think the fear of people is that number one, I can, I afford it. And number two, how easy it is to re-rent it. And what I found is as you get further out in the suburbs, it's harder to re-rent them. Um, but if you have a single family house out in the suburbs, it's usually a longer rent because they usually have families and they want to stay in the schools. So it's this toss up of really where you want to be, what you want to get out of it. Um, some people just like Washington because they know there's turnover all the time. I mean, even in the winter months where it's slower, there's still a little bit of turnover here. Um, but, you know, you have to watch it in the it, it's just really where you want to be, what you want to do with it and how long you want to keep it. And I think those are the questions that I ask them. The rest of it is just following the rules. And I think if you have a, a good property manager or somebody that knows the area and knows the laws, then it's not a problem. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think a good way for us to kind of start coming to a close would be to, you know, talk about what a management property or what a management company does, but then sure. maybe giving some broad rules. Like, you know, you said, I probably talked about in an earlier episode about getting a basic business license. I don't know if I have, um, if we've had an episode that's really covered that before, sure. but I mean, that's stuff that any realtor theoretically should know. I know that, you know, I tell people that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, what are some kind of broad things that people can start to do on their own? And then what's the benefit of having a management company who potentially would either do it all or guide you through the whole process? So I think doing it all by yourself, if you don't live here, is virtually impossible. I think you can't come here for a weekend and expect to rent it, do your license, do all the paperwork, do all that stuff by yourself. Um, I think that's the purpose of a management company. Uh, I think when you're interviewing management companies, I think you should do your homework first online and you know, call different. I tell them all the time, call different people, see what answers they give you compared to what I give you, because you just have to know everything you're getting yourself into. And if they're not telling you something that I told you, then come back to me and we can talk further. I think the purpose of the management company, I call it a hands-off process. I, I call it, you know, you just have to get out and leave and you want everything to be handled from marketing, you know, bookkeeping, tax filing, you know, business license filing. Um, the business license changed a lot in 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's stricter now. There's more inspections. There's harder inspection protocols that you have to pass. So I, I think there's a big benefit in Washington to have an educated property manager who knows what they're doing. You know, you also want to ask how big is their portfolio? How many people are working for you? You know, what kind of service are you going to get on the weekends? Because in this business, it's Murphy's Law when, you know, it's going to happen at five o'clock on Friday afternoon and it's going to go all weekend long. Is, is the property manager going to be willing to do that? And that's something I, I provide. Um, I don't keep the portfolio in the hundreds of properties just because I want to be able to provide that kind of service. Um, so I think the more questions the you know, the owner asks, the better, the more knowledge they get, the better. Uh, I think you compare it to different management companies. But I, I think to do it yourself, if you don't live here, if you've never lived in Washington, uh, I think it's just a very hard process to get through. Um, you just have to have, you know, all the right, even the forms coming down to the lease. The lease is humongous here. It's like the biggest lease I've ever seen. <laughs> People are, think it's bigger than a sales contract. I mean, it's literally like 26 pages with all the tenant stuff in it. Um, so it's just huge with all the lead based paint forms and the tenants rights forms and the lease itself. And, uh, you really have to understand why you're giving these papers out, which forms you have to give out because, you know, if they're taken to court for some reason and, and the judge doesn't see one of these, that that's going to impact you. So, I mean, I, I do want to spend a minute on this just like, so I, I know that there are different rules that apply to when real estate agents or property managers like you and I do things versus if somebody on their own were to just do all of this, um, if they don't have the proper kind of, I mean, they don't have access to the leases that we have, right? Because they don't have access to those forms. So what kind of rules govern them? Um, I don't think it's any different, to be honest. I, I think the lease is a contract between two parties. Uh, the things that are in those leases are that we use in the GCAR forms are basically used to protect the agent and the landlord uh, more so than the tenant, actually. Um, and a lease, I, I guess you can theoretically use your own lease, 
uh, sometimes the HOAs or the condo associations have to approve those leases. And usually with the GCAR leases, it's a no brainer because they know it's being governed by the real estate board. Uh, but sometimes if you have these, you know, online leases that you just download and start filling out the, some of the clauses in them aren't really spe- you know, specified for Washington, DC, the other forms like the tenants rights forms and the lead based paint, those are all required by the district. And if you don't give them and you don't know how to give them, um, you know, that that's where the problem can come in later on. When If you are taken to court by a tenant, then you weren't given those forms because um, a judge can say, why weren't they given those forms? Why weren't the lead based paint forms given? Why wasn't this given? And pe- the owner's like, I don't know. And they just don't know. But that's the point of having professional service. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that, you know, ignorance is not an excuse in some of these situations, Um, you know, because I think some people do go into this um, wanting to do it on their own just because they don't want to spend the money. money. Yeah, exactly. They don't, or they don't think it's that hard, or yeah. they think that all, that it is okay to just download forms on their own. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm the kind of person where you know I'm kind of paranoid that the that what could go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. And I mean, so I, so I'm always trying this to do. This is things. my business. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to do things by the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I think that that's a really important point about the forms and stuff because yeah. you know if somebody and you know and then there's you know finding p- finding tenants and all that like yeah. That could be challenging if you're not a if you're not a realtor or don't have access to you know all the ways that we yeah. can find tenants. But yeah, well, this is obviously we could talk about this kind of stuff for a long time. And I'm certainly going to link your information in the show notes because sure. if anybody is interested and you know either talking to you or utilizing you and your company for property management, I know that you are one of the best um, and you have you're an incredible resource truly. So um, I just want to thank Appreciate you for it. coming on, Absolutely. and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it.